Lyudmila Pavlichenko was a famous and extremely effective Soviet sniper who fought in the Eastern Front of the Second World War. Aside from killing 309 fascists in just over a year of fighting, she also played a crucial role in getting America to join the fight against the Nazis. Those whom she fought to protect would learn to respect her, and her enemies would fear the legendary sharpshooter known to them as Lady Death. This video will cover the life of the deadliest female sniper in history and her acts of heroism both on and off the battlefield. Here are some facts that will be useful for understanding the rest of the video. Operation Barbarossa was the name given to Nazi Germany's attack on the Soviet Union, violating the non-aggression pact that the two nations had agreed to. After going through a fascist coup led by Jan Antonescu, Romania would join the Second World War as part of the Axis and would aid Germany in invading the USSR. The Order of Lenin was bestowed upon both members of the military and civilians for exemplary service to the Soviet government and society. The title Hero of the Soviet Union was the USSR's highest distinction given in the form of a certificate, identification booklet, and gold star medal. It was given alongside the Order of Lenin and reserved only for those who had accomplished the greatest feats in service to the Soviet Union. The sight of the medal would bring instant admiration and respect. Semyon Budyani was the commander of the Moscow Military District and former Marshal of the Soviet Union. One of the few high-ranking officers to survive the purge, he was a famed war hero and one of five in all of Soviet history to become a hero of the Soviet Union three times. Lyudmila Mikhailovna Belova was born on July 12th of 1916 in Belayetserkov, a village near Kiev. She was born to Mikhail Belov, a veteran of the Civil War, and Elena Belova. In 1932, she began working in a Kiev factory at the age of 16, interrupting her studies. The factory provided its workers with opportunities to attend classes and activities concerning the arts and sports, and Lyudmila decided to spend her time learning how to shoot. The first firearm she would operate would be the Taz 8, a simple and easily produced bolt action rifle. From the very first shots she fired, it was immediately apparent to her instructor that she was incredibly talented. Not long after joining, Lyudmila earned the Voroshilov Marksman Badge. Because of this program, Lyudmila developed a passion for weaponry and shooting. However, she would continue school in 1935, leaving the factory and the shooting program. Around this time, she married Alexei Pavlichenko, but the marriage didn't last long and the two would never meet again after 1938. Lyudmila's son, Rostislav, would stay with her side of the family. Lyudmila Pavlichenko would again start to shoot after the bombing of Guernica, Spain in 1937, fearing that she might need the skills in case of a future fascist threat. This time, she joined a rigorous two-year program designed at developing the best sharpshooters. This is when she would be introduced to the Mosin three-line rifle. By the end of the course, she would know it like the back of her hand, being able to assemble and disassemble it with her eyes closed. Like her previous teacher, her new instructor was also quick to recognize Pavlichenko's abilities and regarded her as one of his most capable pupils. By the time she had graduated from this program in 1939, the Nazis had already begun their conquest of Europe, swiftly occupying entire countries. Pavlichenko, like many other Russians at the time, believed that the Red Army would easily crush the Nazis if such fighting was to occur, and continued attending university as usual. In January of 1941, Pavlichenko moved to Odessa to work as a research assistant in one of Ukraine's most established libraries, thinking that this would facilitate her path to a diploma. Before setting off, she bid farewell to her family, not knowing that the next time she would see them, she would be a soldier. 
It was on June 22, 1941, when Pavlichenko's life would change unexpectedly, and the day would remain etched in her memory. For Pavlichenko, it was a regular, clear Sunday in Odessa. She was eating in a cafe on Pushkin Street with some colleagues when a bizarre announcement was made. Germany had invaded the USSR. The gravity of the situation was not realized by many in the city. No plans were cancelled and business continued as usual, but reality would soon strike the citizens of the Soviet Union. They had just been thrust into the most brutal conflict in human history. Pavlichenko attempted to enlist the day after the announcement, but was turned away. The man she talked to didn't know what a sniper was, as it was not yet an established role in the military. On top of that, he had a hard time wrapping his head around the fact that women could serve in the army as anything other than medical staff. Undeterred, she came back the next day to a new registrar and joined the other recruits in setting off for the front on June 24th, 1941. Pavlichenko had been assigned to the 54th Stepan Raisin Rifle Regiment, part of the 24th Shapayev Rifle Division. She was sworn into the military on June 28th. Pavlichenko was disappointed, however, when she was only given an RGD-33 hand grenade as a result of a weapons shortage plaguing the entire Soviet army. Much of the Soviet army was forced to retreat during the first month of the war, but Pavlichenko's division was able to hold their ground on the Prut River. Nevertheless, in July, the 25th Rifle Division, as well as the rest of the Soviet forces at the southern front, would be forced to retreat by Romanian forces, who vastly outnumbered the Soviets and had been given superior war technology by the Germans. During this withdrawal, Pavlichenko would first witness the suffering of innocent and unarmed people. However, there wasn't much she could do about it with a single hand grenade at her disposal. 
This would change when a comrade struck and heavily injured by artillery fire handed her a Mosin Nagant three-line rifle. On the 8th of August, 1941, the fascists would get their first taste of Private Pavlochenko's noble rage, losing two officers to her in the Romanian-occupied village of Belyayevka. From that point on, Pavlochenko's tally would grow steadily day by day. The enemy forces outnumbered the Soviets 6 to 1, but even though they were undersupplied and outmanned, the Soviet troops would succeed in repelling the enemy on several occasions. Unfortunately, regardless of the skill and resolve of soldiers such as Lyudmila, the enemy's advance would continue, mostly by attrition, with the enemy enjoying superiority in nearly every factor but determination. One of these factors was artillery, and only 11 days after her debut as a sniper, Lyudmila would be struck in a barrage of artillery fire. The injuries she suffered caused her to be sent to a hospital back in Odessa. On August 30th, she would be returned to the front lines and be promoted to the rank of corporal just a month and a half after joining the army. During this stage of the war, Pavlichenko and two others would sneak close to the enemy, utilizing various hideouts. They would then suddenly open fire, regularly killing as much as 20 soldiers, many of which were officers, in a day. After one particularly successful mission, she was promoted to the rank of junior sergeant for her incredible shooting. She was so effective that the commander of the entire 25th Rifle Division, Ivan Yefimovich Petrov, personally gave her the new SVT-40 rifle, engraved with his congratulations for her first 100 fallen invaders. While the two were talking, Petrov inquired if she was Ukrainian, considering her last name. Pavlochenko explained that she was a Russian and that her maiden name was Belov. Petrov recognized the name and quickly figured out that he had fought alongside Lyudmila's father, earning the Order of the Red Banner with him while fighting in the Civil War. Pavlochenko had just made a valuable acquaintance in the Soviet High Command, and her connection to Ivan Petrov would prove to be valuable on many occasions throughout the war. Not long had passed since her meeting with Petrov when she was promoted to the rank of Sergeant. The regimental commander also assigned her with training new sharpshooters, and gave her the ability to choose the finest soldiers in the regiment to train. Some soldiers were doubtful that a woman could teach them how to shoot, but Pavlochenko quickly taught them to respect her. Those she trained would themselves become great sharpshooters and would fight alongside her, defending and reclaiming strategically important villages near Odessa. It was in the villages that she liberated that Pavlochenko had the opportunity to befriend some of the locals. Through them, she learned about the terrible crimes committed against them by the occupying Nazis. The horrific stories told to her would once and for all solidify her hatred towards the invaders. On the 13th of October, 1941, Pavlochenko decided to use the SVT-40 given to her by Major General Petrov. The SVT was a new model, and despite having clear advantages in some situations, the rifle was complicated and prone to malfunctioning when operated in suboptimal conditions. This is what caused the rifle to malfunction during this particularly fierce battle in the dusty Black Sea steppe. 
In order to repair the rifle in the cramped trenches, Pavlochenko had to take off her helmet to inspect her weapon and figure out what had gone wrong. As the mechanisms of the weapon were starting to give way, she was struck in the face by a splinter from a mortar explosion. Luckily for her, the rifle did come in handy that day. Because the inscription on her rifle showed that she was an associate of the Major General, she was given priority treatment, quite possibly saving her life. At this point, she had nearly doubled the number engraved on her rifle, having killed 187 fascists. When passing through Odessa, Pavlochenko saw that a lot had changed in the three months since the war had started. Most of the city was now in ruins. The Soviets would retreat from Odessa to the Crimean Peninsula as she was recovering, and she would stay with the 47th Medical Battalion during this journey. From the port in Odessa, the 54th Rifle Regiment was transported by the Black Sea Fleet to Sevastopol, facing aerial attacks along the way. When Pavlochenko arrived at Sevastopol, she was surprised about how oddly peaceful the city was, especially compared to the destruction that she had witnessed in Odessa. The people of Crimea were friendly and the soldiers were treated well. Within a week of arrival, on October 21st, Pavlochenko's division defended the north side of the peninsula from the Germans, but she had not yet healed and did not go with them. As she was recovering, Pavlochenko was promoted to the rank of senior sergeant. By chance, she once again ran into Major General Petrov, who gave her command of a sniper platoon consisting of 51 soldiers. Sergeant Pavlochenko and her platoon would rejoin the regiment during the brutal fighting in nearby villages occupied by the Nazis. Back in action, she carefully executed attacks on the Germans that inflicted heavy losses, including many officers. Pavlochenko once again befriended and inspired the locals to fight alongside her, with some even formally joining the Red Army. On December 19th, while defending the Soviet lines from a German armored vehicle, Pavlochenko was incapacitated by a shell that had struck her in the shoulder, causing serious bleeding and pinning her under a tree. After miraculously being found and rescued by an acquaintance, Alexei Kitsenko, she was taken to a field hospital. Less than a week later, the two would get married, and despite the bloody war that she was fighting in, she would later say that she was completely happy during those days. Senior Sergeant Pavlochenko had gathered such a reputation that legends began to be circulated amongst both her fellow soldiers and her enemies, with some maintaining that she had supernatural powers. The rumors about her were outlandish, but they certainly existed for a reason as she accomplished more and more incredible feats. She succeeded in eliminating an accomplished German sniper, Helmut Bommel, who had fought in several theaters of war killed 215 Allied soldiers, and served as a sniping instructor in Berlin. Pavlochenko and her platoon were also specially brought in to eliminate a particularly dangerous group of Nazi snipers who were repeatedly attacking Soviet forces. After the fight had been won, they managed to take enemy documents, military devices, and an important position, all without losing a single soldier. After these incidents, she became famous not only among her comrades on the front, but throughout the entirety of the Soviet Union. On the 2nd of February, 1942, Pavlochenko was invited to speak at a conference along with other famous female figures, many of whom were accomplished soldiers like herself. This was the first time Pavlochenko attended an event like this, and she did not consider herself good at public speaking. However, despite her previous lack of confidence, 
She was so moved by the previous speakers that she abandoned the notes she had prepared and delivered a passionate speech. It wasn't just Pavlichenko who was being recognized for his service, though. The Soviet soldiers in and around Sevastopol were generally treated like heroes in the towns and villages that they defended. The locals would let them into their houses and treat them with meals and gifts. Shoe shiners and washerwomen would also perform their services free of charge. The spring had not yet come when Sergeant Pavlichenko's husband was killed. The two were talking about childhood memories when Kitsenko was suddenly struck by splinters from an enemy shell. There was little hope of recovery as he struggled in and out of consciousness over the following days. He died of his injuries on March 4th, 1942 and was buried soon after. Pavlichenko was diagnosed with PTSD a few days later. Unfortunately, Pavlichenko would have little time to grieve. The Germans were gathering their forces in preparation to attack the city directly. They outnumbered the Soviet troops 2 to 1, in artillery units nearly 4 to 1, and in aircraft 8 to 1. On top of that, the Soviets were low on ammo. The Germans would take the entire Kerch Peninsula, and they would launch devastating consecutive air attacks granting little respite for the overwhelmed Soviet pilots and citizens of Sevastopol. The weather was scorching hot, reaching 40 degrees Celsius, and there were constant fires due to the bombing. These problems were only worsened by the drought caused by the destroyed pipelines. Despite their grim situation, the defenders of Sevastopol prepared to fight tooth and nail. The SVT-40 was complex and temperamental, so while fighting in the forests and trenches of Crimea, Pavlichenko relied on the Mosin rifle and used the SVT mainly for events where no actual fighting would take place. However, when the Nazis launched another assault on Sevastopol on the 7th of June, 1942, Pavlichenko decided that its time had finally come. Preparing to repel a horde of enemy infantry, Pavlichenko devised a new strategy. She would shoot the stomachs of the second row rather than the heads of the first. A shot to the stomach was mortal, but not instant, causing the soldiers to writhe and scream in pain. This would disrupt the soldiers around them and lower the morale of the enemy. Although Pavlichenko managed to stop the German advance on her position, the Germans broke through Soviet defenses two kilometers away and entered the city. A large part of the Soviet forces were destroyed, as ammunition and food became even more desperately scarce. Pavlichenko knew that the enemy was bound to capture the city, but nevertheless, the beaten and bandaged Soviet forces swore to fight with no less determination than when the war had just begun. A few days later, Pavlichenko was struck by artillery again and was heavily wounded. She was transported along with the other injured soldiers to Novorossiysk. Pavlichenko and her comrades had managed to hold back the Nazis for a full 250 days, but Sevastopol eventually fell to the enemy while she was recovering. Pavlichenko's division, the 25th Shepayev Division, was destroyed and her friends had all perished as Sevastopol was captured. Pavlichenko would run into Ivan Petrov once again in Novorossiysk. To the surprise of the Major General, she requested to be returned to combat. When asked why she was so eager to fight, she responded, I have still not yet gotten even with the Nazis for the death of my army friends, for the deaths of the totally innocent, peaceful residents. The Nazis must be punished for what they have committed on our land. However, despite her heroic enthusiasm, Pavlichenko would not see action again. As recognition for her bravery and service, Major General Petrov recommended Pavlichenko to Marshal Semyon Budyani 
for a promotion to the rank of junior lieutenant. Even the famous war hero Budiani was impressed by Pavlochenko's tally of 309 fascists, and she was given the promotion she desired, and was awarded the Order of Lenin as well. Junior Lieutenant Pavlochenko was now the commander of a sniper platoon in the 32nd Guards Parachute Division, which, despite the word parachute in the name, was currently just division for the Red Army's best infantry due to the lack of planes. Pavlochenko was flown to Moscow, where the division was located, along with Major Petrov, who was flying there to report to Stalin. After speaking at a Komsomol Central Committee meeting in Moscow, the first secretary of the Komsomol Central Committee, Nikolai Mikhailov, noted that Pavlochenko had talent as an orator. Despite this, Pavlochenko didn't use her speaking abilities much while continuing to live in Moscow, choosing not to interact with people aside from attending meetings and training snipers. She avoided socializing and skipped regular social events, quietly grieving her husband. She was also needed for propaganda purposes and was interviewed by many journalists, some of whom published as much fiction as fact. On the 3rd of August, 1942, Pavlochenko's life would take another turn. The President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt invited the Soviet Union to send three delegates to speak in the USA in order to convince America to help the Allies in Europe. Pavlochenko was unaware that she was chosen until just two days before her journey to the USA would begin. She and the others that were chosen were briefed by Joseph Stalin himself and then were put on a long series of flights to America. Almost immediately after arriving in America, she met the First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt over an American breakfast. As they were meeting for the first time, the First Lady struck Pavlochenko as a bit rude and ignorant. The delegation's first conference did not go well either. After the three gave their speeches, the American journalists largely ignored what they had just said and sent Pavlochenko a barrage of insulting questions. They were given contempt-filled replies in return. After the slanging match, Eleanor Roosevelt offered to drive Pavlochenko to supper, seeming to have forgotten their earlier interaction. Pavlochenko accepted her invitation and would consequently witness her Vin Diesel-esque driving. Perhaps life-threatening situations bring people together, because as the Soviet representatives attended more public functions, Pavlochenko became close friends with the First Lady and would run into FDR multiple times as well. Despite her new friend, Pavlochenko still wished to return to the USSR and fight, but the task of the Soviet delegation was extended and they would continue to raise awareness of their struggle in the US. Pavlochenko traveled with the First Lady all across the country, and it's safe to assume that she played a large role in shifting American public opinion. She would deliver powerful speeches, with an uncanny ability to generate unforgettable quotes. One of these came from a particularly riveting speech in Chicago. Gentlemen, I am 25 years old. 
At the front, I have wiped out 309 Nazi soldiers and officers. Don't you think, gentlemen, that you have been hiding for too long behind my back? Such words had a tremendous impact and were published across the nation. Eventually, Ludmilla had finished her job in the U.S. Setting off from the States with lavish gifts from the First Lady, she briefly visited Canada and was flown to the U.K. There, she and her fellow soldiers were greeted with an impressive military welcome. When the press conference started, Pavlichenko was not asked any insulting questions, and the British journalists conducted themselves quite well. Pavlichenko and her comrades visited representatives of the British Armed Forces, and British military technology was demonstrated to them. The three met Churchill and his wife, with Pavlichenko talking about her history with the Soviet medical battalions. Pavlichenko was never a fan of Churchill, and this fact didn't change after their meeting. Finally, on January 5th of 1943, the Soviet delegation would return to Moscow. Soviet authorities were particularly pleased with Pavlichenko's performance, and perhaps because of this, Pavlichenko would not be returning to combat as she hoped. Instead, she would be given a promotion and placed into the Red Army High Command Reserve. At this point, the citizens of the Soviet Union had become somewhat familiar with how Stalin conducted the arrests of people under suspicion, so you can imagine what Lieutenant Pavlichenko and her mother Elena Belova were thinking when the NKVD came knocking on their door one night. In fact, Pavlichenko's mother was so overcome by fear that her hands trembled with worry. Luckily for Pavlichenko, she was headed for the Kremlin rather than a prison. She had been summoned by Stalin to report the results of her mission to the U.S., and was to inform the Supreme Commander-in-Chief about leaders she had met and her own military service. Even though she was initially extremely nervous talking to Uncle Joseph, she eventually became emboldened and requested to be put back into the fighting to the leader of the USSR himself. This request confused Stalin, who asked why she would want to return to the front after she had been heavily wounded multiple times and gotten PTSD. Lieutenant Pavlichenko replied, There have been many casualties in this war, but somebody has to fight. I want to go back to my comrades in arms. This response seemed to make a good impression on Stalin, but he had to deny her wish. Pavlichenko was needed to pass on her priceless knowledge to other snipers. Starting in August of 1943, Pavlichenko was trained in the Vistral course, an intense program for training officers. Upon her graduation on October 25, 1943, she was awarded the title Hero of the Soviet Union for her deeds in combat earlier in her career, and would stay at the institution to teach there. In January of 1944, as the absolute victory of the Soviet Union became more and more certain, Pavlichenko traveled to her hometown of Kiev to finish her studies, and would return to her son and mother in Moscow as the war ended in May of 1945. Pavlichenko continued her service in the military as a research assistant in the Navy until she retired in 1958 as a result of old physical and mental wounds worsening over time. After leaving the military, she was elected to the Presidium Bureau of the Soviet Committee for War Veterans and continued to be an important figure testing out new military technology and being invited to training sessions. She partook in the development of the SVD rifle, along with Vladimir Chelensev, who was also one of the three members of the Soviet delegation which was sent to the US, and Vasily Zaitsev, another legendary sniper credited with killing 225 Nazis in the span of three months. The Dragunov rifle was selected for service in 1962, and for their participation, each of the veterans would receive a unique combat pistol built exclusively for them. Pavlichenko also served as a role model for the Soviet youth, being invited to appear and speak at many events. 
Lyudmila Pavlichenko would often visit the city of Sevastopol to see it blossom once again, and remember her lost husband and comrades who defended the city and their country all of those years ago. Lyudmila Pavlichenko would pass away on October the 10th, 1974, at the age of 58, as a result of a stroke. Pavlutenko is buried in the Novodevichy Cemetery in Moscow, an honor shared with Nikita Khrushchev, Anton Chekhov, Boris Yeltsin, and Mstislav Rostropovich. Lyudmila Pavlichenko will forever be remembered not only as a soldier of immeasurable skill, but as a hero who did her part in stopping fascism. She served not just her country, but the world, with a degree of honor and courage rare even amongst history's greatest heroes. A legend and an icon, she was most certainly a notable figure. So, as you can probably tell by the timestamp on this video and my uh, horrendous upload schedule, uh, if you can call it that, this video took an extremely long time to research, write, narrate, and edit, so it would mean a lot to me if you subscribed and did all that other stuff that the YouTube people tell you to do. Uh, you know the drill. That would mean a lot to me. So, see you in two years when I finally finish my next video. Yeah.